Okay, tonight, the title of this message is, He is Like a Tree. Weird, huh? And this is a continuation of our series in the Beatitudes. And this is actually part two of the message, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Here's how Matthew 5, 1 through 6 goes. And all the further we're going to get tonight is through verse 6. Seeing the crowds, he, meaning Jesus, went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Let's pray really quick. Heavenly Father, in your mercy and in your wisdom, in your time, Lord, I pray that you would give us a ravenous hunger, not for the things of this world, not even for things that the world, the things that we all accept as good. Don't give us a hunger, Lord, just for being kind and being nice and generous and, and things like that. Lord, give us a ravenous hunger, Lord, for something that's going to last. Lord, give us a hunger for things that will make us happy and help us identify exactly what those things will be in our life and how we're coming into contact with those things here in your word. Be in our hearts, be in our minds. Lord, we need you. We can't do this without you. We're stubborn, obstinate and not willing to heed your call. We're not willing to listen to your voice unless you come in and change our hearts. Lord, I pray that you do that for us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, what are you hungry for? What are you hungry for? There's a lot of different things that we could mean when we talk about being hungry. If you were to say, Rob, are you hungry right now? As in, Rob, do you need to eat right now? Like, are you starving? I'd say, no. In that sense, I am not hungry. Obviously, not one little bit. But we never use that word. We never use the word hungry quite like that, do we? As if it were life and death. Chances are most of us have never experienced hunger as a matter of life and death. And most likely, uh, we never will, those of us in this room. Yet we use that word anyway, hungry. The statement Jesus makes in Matthew 5, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, it definitely pertains to our most fundamental need for righteousness. So, when Jesus is saying hunger and thirst for righteousness, he's saying that we need righteousness, the kind of need that's like starving. We are starving for righteousness, right? We must be fully 100% righteous to stand before God and live in his glorious presence forever. And there is no alternative. There will be a day in all our futures when the only thing left in your life that matters at all is whether or not you're righteous. We will be stripped of all earthly treasures no matter how much we own right now, no matter how much we own by the time we die, no matter how much money we have in the bank by the time we die, and no matter how loved we are, no matter how many people love us by the time we die, it won't matter. On that day of wrath, as we stand before God to be judged according to what we've done, the only thing that will matter will be whether or not you are fully 100% righteous. So if you're hoping to not go to hell, which is what everyone in the world wants. The only thing that will save your skin and let you into heaven is righteousness. Righteousness. Well, that's cool, right? That's cool. So how are you doing on that? How are you doing on righteousness? 100% righteous, 100% of the time, and there are no second chances. You realize, don't you, that, that you have to never have done anything wrong, ever. You not only have to not only have never done anything wrong, but you have to have done all possible good at all times while you're alive on the earth. If you are not doing everything good that you possibly can, then you're, you're not righteous. Guys, righteousness does not mean pretty good from time to time. That's not what righteousness means. We hardly ever use this word in everyday life anymore, so it's hard to grasp the severity of its definition. But the term we should be using as a standard to define what's good, what's truly good or what's bad, is righteousness. If you know what the word righteousness means, then you'll know that you haven't been anything close to righteous at any point in your life, let alone all throughout your life. You haven't been righteous. And you know what? You're not going to be. In Isaiah, the, uh, God says that your righteousness, my righteousness, is as filthy rags. And that was their term for toilet paper, by the way. Well, how does my righteousness compare to what it needs to be? Like used toilet paper. There's a word for it I'm not going to say. So if riches don't save us and our strength can't save us, then what's going to happen to us if we fail to be righteous? 
If you think about it long enough, you'll see what I'm talking about, that this statement of Jesus, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, is definitely referring to our most fundamental and desperate spiritual need. We're more desperate for it than we realize. We're starving for righteousness more than we realize until we realize. Perhaps the Lord will impress on our hearts our great need for righteousness and reveal to our hearts how we constantly turn away from it. We constantly turn away from righteousness. I pray that God will bring us to a place where we recognize that we are desperate for the mercy and kindness of one who has righteousness, who might be willing to give it to us as we plead, as if we were a poor beggar and we're about to die of starvation. In desperation, may we plead for righteousness from the one and the only one who has it. And like Jesus said, they're blessed. They are blessed, for they shall be satisfied. May we come begging and pleading. May we come poor in spirit. And Jesus says, they're blessed, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So, hunger and thirst is most certainly pertaining to desperate need. We need to eat good food and drink good water in order to live. This is a fundamental physical need. We'll die if we don't eat and drink. And along with keeping us alive, eating and drinking is also a source of great pleasure for us. We like to eat. We like to drink. It's something that, we'll, that we like to do with one another, and we find, I think, that, that the acts of eating and drinking provide more than mere survival, don't they? They come to be a valuable, valuable source of delight for us big time. Sometime, grab your Coke. When you have a Coke, look at what it says, okay? What does it say? Enjoy Coke. Look at this slide. I found this one when I was looking for the Coke slide. <laughs> this one is very interesting. Open happiness. Well, what do you do with a bottle of Coke? What do you do with it? You don't play with it, do you? I mean, maybe you can after it's empty. You can use it as a rolling pin. But what do you do with this Coke bottle once you open it? Obviously, you drink it. And their claim is that you're drinking happiness. In order to be happy, drink. Drink something. This is fascinating. Uh, when it comes to eating, uh, <laughs> there are certain types of ethnic restaurants, and just about in every single one of them, the host waiter, when you come in and you ask for a table, they sit you at the table and they put the silverware right down in front of you, and before they leave your table, they say, enjoy. Enjoy what? What, what are we supposed to enjoy? When they sit us down at the table, enjoy the place? Enjoy the table? What is, what is he trying to tell us to enjoy? Food. Enjoy eating the food here. Enjoy eating. So here we have Coke. Enjoy Coke. Be happy by drinking it. So eating and drinking meets a fundamental physical need. That's true. And eating and drinking also meets a fundamental physical desire. So that's why last week my focus was on our most fundamental spiritual need, which is for righteousness. We're doomed to be cast into eternal death of God's judgment without it. So we need righteousness. We need it. We're starving for it. But tonight, we're going to see what righteousness has to do with our most fundamental spiritual desire. What would it be like to eat it and drink it, to eat and drink righteousness? What would it be like? What is Jesus getting at when he describes our relation to righteousness this way? So tonight, I'd like to bring to our attention a few ways in which hunger and thirst for righteousness and being satisfied by righteousness are manifest in the life of one who loves Jesus Christ. I started off tonight by asking you if you're hungry. And if you are, because you are, what are you hungry for? As a kid, guys, my favorite movie, and I mean from the time I was three years old, my favorite movies were the Rocky movies. Rocky is a movie series about a washed up and troubled and marginally so-so boxer named Rocky. And he's given the chance to fight for the championship. And he ends up fighting surprisingly well against the champ, right? But he loses at the end by a split decision. There's three boxing judges down by the ring when they're fighting. And so by the end of the match, you have three judges that score the fight a certain way. And when you have a split decision, that means one of the three judges picked one guy, and the two other guys picked Another guy. So in this movie, Rocky loses this fight by split decision. And so Rocky lost technically, but he was not beaten. In the second Rocky movie, the champion is really bothered, right, because Rocky went all the way, 15 rounds with him. The champion thought he was going to clobber him. Rocky was supposed to be a nobody. Rocky went all 15 rounds. And at the end, he even got one of the judges to score him as the winner. And this bothered the champion. And so he, he asked for a rematch. 
And in the end, by the end of the second movie, spoiler alert, Rocky actually beats the champion in a full-out knockout. In the third movie, Rocky gets beat by a motivated up-and-comer, and it wasn't even close. He got plowed. His trainer warned him that he was going to lose the fight, and he warned him that he was going to lose it big. And the reason the trainer gave him, the word that the trainer used to help Rocky understand what the difference was between him and this upcoming fighter, the word that he used was hungry. Rocky, you are going to lose this fight because you are not hungry anymore. And he says this iconic line, you ain't been hungry since you wore that belt. The opponent was hungry, and Rocky wasn't hungry. So what does hunger have to do with something like this? Think about it. Appetite, desire, and want. Like I've been asking, what are you hungry for? Now, whenever we go down to Minot, I start to get hungry for something. And what I'm getting hungry for is not a boxing championship. I get hungry for burger time, the drive through restaurant. <laughs> it doesn't matter if I just ate. If we're going to Minot, I want food from burger time, even when I'm not hungry. If we don't stop there before we go home, I can be driving all the way home thinking about burger time. Oh, I didn't get my bigger burger, and I'm disappointed. Now, we don't ever leave my not hungry. Sometimes other kinds of food just doesn't cut it. I'm simply not satisfied if I don't get what I really want. I'm not hungry anymore, but I'm not satisfied unless I get what I really want. Can you guys relate? When I was a teenager, I used to look through catalogs where all the latest guitars were being advertised and sold, and there were several that I craved just from the pictures and the descriptions in the catalog. Can you guys relate? If only I could try one. I grew up in Minot, and back then there were only two kinds of guitars you could get pretty much anywhere in the state, and ni neither of those two kinds of guitars were anything like the guitar that I wanted from the catalog. And oh, how I thought about guitars, and oh, how I dreamt of guitars. Like the word from the Christmas song, I pined. I pined, even though guitars are made of mahogany. <laughs> I thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> All right, guys, I long for the opportunity to just try one of these guitars in the catalog, and I thought about it all the time, knowing that if I could just see one, knowing if I could just try one, I would most certainly spend most of my diligently earned money just to buy it, and without a doubt, I would suddenly turn into a real-life rock star, fully legit, and everything in the world would be awesome and amazing just because of the guitar. In the meantime, the local store ended up having one uh, that was kind of like the guitar that I wanted from the catalog, but it wasn't one of the big name brands. It wasn't one of the big name brands. It had all the guitar gizmos that I wanted, all of them. Almost identical, actually. But, but this one that was in the local store wasn't the one in the catalog. But there it was. I got to play it. They let me take it home for a couple days. I got to play it. Eh, whatever. Now, I bargained it way down. It had been in the store for like three years, and... They just need to get rid of it, so I was able to bargain it way down in price. It was, it was actually kind of cheap of me, the price that I ended up getting them to sell it for. Uh, so I had the money. It wasn't a big deal. It was better than nothing, right? It'll hold me over for now, right? But when I can get one from the catalog, then I'll really rock. So right before I turned 16, my family went on a trip. The catalog I'm looking at, they had a music store location along our route. And... <laughs> We got to stop. Dad, we got to stop at that store. He's a musician too. It was an easy sell, right? I had to see this guitar I wanted so badly. I had to play it. I had to buy it. I had to. So I was able to go in and try it. And guess what? The guitar I bought locally back in Minot, the one that was just going to hold me over for a little while, smoked the one in the store. Smoked it. It wasn't even close. My eh guitar from the Minot store, in every way, was so much better than the one from the catalog. And I had a serious, severe, and permanent paradigm shift in my heart and mind. And it's applied to everything in my life. I want to share it with you. Listen. What I had already was significantly better. Okay? That's a spiritual statement. What I had already was significantly better than all the guitars in the catalog that I ravenously hungered for. 
And from that time on, having come to realize the worth of what I had, and by taking delight in it, I've been satisfied when it comes to guitars. Ever since that day, I've gone into guitar stores hundreds of times, and I've tried out hundreds of guitars that I've seen in magazines and catalogs, and because of that one that I already had, the one whose worth I had neglected, the guitar that I would have so readily forsaken, I would have. Because my eyes were open, and I recognized, to my delight, its worth and its workmanship. I've never felt like I've ever wanted or needed another electric guitar in all my life. All right? So just really quick, some of you, especially Jody, <laughs> is going to ask, then why do you have 11 of them? <laughs> if you've never needed or wanted another electric guitar in your life, why do you have 11 of them? There's something about hunger and thirst and being satisfied that brings a contentment we all desire. To already have what we really want and to want nothing more. To be satisfied. Oftentimes we'll find that only after that opportunities come up for us to have something or to do something or to know someone. And it's cool. And it's worthwhile. But when we're content, these things, they come to us without the awful bondage of craving, without the pining, and then, in contentedness, we are really free to rightfully use and truly enjoy the people, things, and opportunities that God means to give us as gifts. Without satisfaction, things, situations, and relationships that are designed to be good and helpful gifts to us actually become gods. What are you hungry for? Burgers? Boxing? Guitars? Righteousness? These aren't the same thing, but we're talking about the same thing. So what is it about righteousness? It delivers from death in the day of wrath. Sure, it's a good parachute. It's just in case. Best to have one of them righteous things along with us in case it all goes down in flames, right? That's why some people say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's why some people pray the rosary. You know, Hail Mary, full of grace. Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. They pray these things, and they say these things as a bailout, right? The problem is, it's not a bailout. Guys, you need righteousness. You need real righteousness. You don't need a magic trick. You need real righteousness. But Jesus said that righteousness satisfies. Think, think about this. Righteousness satisfies. It doesn't just save. It satisfies. Maybe those two things are the same things, actually. Eating food and drinking water provides for our most basic fundamental need, but it also provides for our most basic and fundamental physical desire. We want food to taste good. We want to delight in what we eat. And we'll totally abandon something that tastes bad for something that tastes good. And Jesus is saying it's the same way with righteousness. Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, guys, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. The poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. The young lions suffer want and hunger. But those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh, children, listen to me. And I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days? That he may see good. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. Wow. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. Guys, when you die in your sin, you'll never be heard from again. But his ears are toward the righteous. And his eyes and ears are towards the righteous and towards their cry. When the righteous cry for help, verse 17, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. 
The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, right? If you love God, you're not spared from these afflictions. There's those in this room who know that very, very well. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all of his bones. He's talking about Jesus, by the way, right now. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked. The troubles of your life will slay those who do not love the Lord. And those who hate the righteous will be condemned in the end. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. I wanted you to hear all of Psalm 34 because it addresses straight on the things we want in our life, the things we live our life for. I'm pulling this verse out. Listen one more time. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. How can you have no lack? Think about it. The young lions suffer want and hunger. They take everything that they want off the Serengeti. You guys ever watch nature channels? What happens when a young lion decides he's going to get what he wants to get? What does he do? He's, it's like a, <laughs> this thing is crazy. He gets everything he wants. Look at what it says. They suffer hunger, suffer want. They hate it. I can't have enough. I can never get enough. But those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. My friends, what do you hunger for? Guys, you're after what everyone else in this world is after, to be happy. Of course you want to be happy. You want what I want. Everybody wants that. Something good that can make me happy and keep me happy? What would you give for something that could do that? What would you give for someone who could do that? And how much more would you give if that hunger could be satisfied forever? Honestly, how much more would it mean to you if the means of righteousness for you, if 100% of the price for all satisfying righteousness were paid for you by Jesus Christ? Because that's what he did. God is the source of all blessing. He's the source of all true delight and all lasting pleasure. Guys, we, we've rejected him. You guys see the insanity of that? We've rejected him. We reject his purpose in us, and we abandon his image that he made us in. So, what does he do? In spite of our sinfulness, in spite of our unworthiness, and in spite of our wretchedness, God sent Jesus to be sin for us, as if we were him, so that we might become the pretty good sometimes of God. You guys catch that? Guys, the body of Jesus Christ given for you on the cross to pay for sins and his resurrection from the dead so that you might be raised to live forever in him is provided to you so that we might become the righteousness of God. Not only so that Jesus' perfect and righteous record before God would count for us, but so that our, our eternal souls might come to live before God and get to be a part of the infinite and eternal joy and love shared by Christ the Son with God the Father. It's so important to our souls that we come to understand that. It's crucial that we come to want that. Guys, that's what we're made to want most of all. And if you have eyes to see, you can look with spiritual eyes with me and see that what's most satisfying in all your life is something, it's someone that you already have. I said a few weeks ago, if that doesn't appeal to you, then I've got nothing. Guys, if that doesn't appeal to you, I've got nothing. I have no ability. And honestly, I have no desire to proclaim this to you in any other way. If the glory of God, if the glory of God and honor of Christ, if beholding the all-satisfying and self-authenticating person of Jesus Christ, if to know what he's done for you and to know why, if that has no appeal to you, I've got nothing. I've got nothing to say about this to you. It's like I've been saying, guys, the Beatitudes, it's not a checklist. It's not about choices. These Beatitudes, these evidences of grace, these joyous exaltations and manifestations of God are either true of you, being born in you by the power of God, or they're just not. The Lord is the source and object of all true delight and all lasting pleasure. He gives it freely, and when he does, he gives it in full measure because it's 100% from himself, and it's 100% of himself and is, in fact, himself. Psalm 37, 4 through 6, Delight yourself in the Lord, 
and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. How? Why? The psalm is assuming something pretty radical. And it might be true of you and it might not. The psalm is assuming that your delight will be the righteousness he brings to you. Anyway, what do you need to want in your life? When I say, what are you hungry for? What should you be hungry for? We need to want that righteousness came to our rescue. Not just that righteousness came to keep us out of hell. It's way more than that. But to save us from the pit and bring us into the presence of God. Where when we're made alive in Christ, we will grow like a plant in the blazing glory of his light. So that we can increase in size, increase in our capacity, and increase in our ability to contain more of what we longed for. What does a tree long for? It longs for water. We'll grow so that we can have more of God in whom we are most pleased and most astounded by. Once we start getting God, and once we start wanting God, we'll want more of God than we ever had before. And it's okay to want more of him because there is more. There's lots more. There's infinitely more of God. And God will give us as much of himself as we can comprehend at any given time. As much of himself as we can think of, as much of him as we can imagine, until we can't contain him anymore. So we must grow, and so we do, so that we can get more, and so we will. The Bible says, blessed is the man who loves the law of God and thinks about it all the time. He's like a tree, like this tree, planted by streams of water, making fruit all the time, and never falling into decay. Here in this imagery, guys, look at the picture. The tree drinks from the stream, and the man who loves the word of God and is consumed with the thoughts of of the word of God drinks from the source of righteousness itself, from the fountain of living waters itself, tasting for himself that the Lord is good. The Lord is good, purer, and better, more satisfying to our souls than all earthly treasures our hearts hunger for. And as the tree by streams of water grows, it gets more from the stream than it ever did before, and therefore grows. It's paradoxically never done drinking, and yet it's always satisfied. Likewise, the righteousness of God manifests for us in the person and work of Jesus on the cross in his resurrection and making us alive in him meets our most fundamental spiritual need by providing it in himself for us and even in paying the price for our sin and bearing 100% of God's just and terrible wrath against it. In other words, Jesus becomes the means of righteousness for us, providing for our most fundamental spiritual need and thus satisfying in himself our God-given inability to be satisfied by anything else. What are you hungry for? Don't you know by now that your heart's hunger for happiness? Don't you know by now that you've traded true happiness for sewage? Wouldn't you agree by now that there isn't a thing in this world you could lay hold of that would satisfy your great needs and wants forever? What do you think that means? Your heart will always hunt and hunger for happiness, no matter what you get or get to have or get to do, because happiness isn't from here, guys. You'll always hunt for it. And you'll never have enough because happiness isn't from here. Nothing here gives it. Nothing here in this world gives lasting happiness. Because nothing here in this world has lasting happiness. At best, relationships and experiences are like happiness because this world is made to reflect the glory of God. It, it, it does, and it will give off a fragrance of happiness from time to time. And uh, that's what we experience when we think that things and people make us happy. It's just the fragrance of happiness that comes from him. Gladness and blessedness is imprinted on everything God has made, everything he had his hand in. But like I said, these things are gifts, guys, not gods. They aren't divine. They aren't eternal. They're, not, they're, they're transient. One day everything in this world will be gone, and you'll stand there, just you and God. What will all that mean to you then? What will all the stuff in this world mean to you then? Riches do not profit then. If God and his glory is your delight and all the things you get to have and do today, and it will all disappear someday, like you know it will, on that day when you stand before God and there's just you and God and nothing else, if God is what you wanted, then you'll be glad. So I'll close with this. You can love everything in this world for the right reason. You can. You can handle everything in this world with the right motive. Everything. But to do so, realize that you can't get happiness from this stuff. Happiness has to come from somewhere else. It has to come from God. 
from living in his presence in unseen and mysterious ways, even now under the protection of a righteous breastplate, under the influence of a righteous Christ-like heart from the Holy Spirit. God doesn't put any limits on giving himself to those who want him. No limits. He is the source and object of true delight and lasting pleasure. Wanting that as a source of pleasure and delight will satisfy you with blessedness and happiness forever. And when it does, when it satisfies you, then you can come into contact with this world's stuff and still be free from want and hunger. You can have the world and be free from want and hunger, free from cravings and pinings. You can then come as a blessing to others. Then and only then can you come to others' rescue for their comfort. When you're truly happy and you're truly satisfied, drinking from the fountain of living waters at all times, and happiness for you doesn't depend on things and circumstances, regardless of good times, regardless of bad times, then and only then you're finally free to just enjoy. Let's pray. God, how we're distracted in this world sparkly things, nice things. I love my guitars, all of them. They're nice. They will not come with me when I die. Nothing will. Why do I put my money and my labors towards things that do not satisfy? Why don't I devote 100% of my efforts and time and heart into things that always satisfy and always will? This is our blindness, God. This is how badly we need help. You are the source of all true and lasting joy and pleasure. And we reject you all the time. Forgive us, God. Lord, it's my prayer that everybody tonight, as they hear me say, we reject you, God, the source of happiness. May we all say, forgive us. God, forgive us. And as we sing now, Lord, continue to open our hearts and minds. Help us to pay attention to you. You're worthy of it. You'll make us happy in ways that we can't ask or think. Be with us that way tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.